four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, a show where two friends watch an episode of the Gen 1 Transformer series in order and then get together to talk about what they saw. Different episode this time. We're not actually going to talk about a particular episode. We're going to reflect on our journey through season one because we just finished talking about season one of Transformers. And we're also going to talk about some just like general reflections of like our experience. I mean, one of the conceits of the show is that we are two Gen Xers who grew up with the show. And we talk about our experiences with it as children and then as adults. And we're going to do a little bit of that about like just the Transformers franchise in general. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist. And the other host is... So, wait a minute. So the six hours I spent this morning studying Autobot Spike were just for nothing? Well, not for nothing. You just wait till next week. Oh. <laughs> Can you hold all that in your head? Or is it too hard to think? <laughs> <laughs> all I know is that Megatron doesn't seem so bad anymore. <laughs> Who am I talking to? You're talking to Hoover, who's, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm wrapping up Hoover, I'm, no, I'm, (laughs) I'm, uh, I can't come up with a nickname without a episode title to base it off of, so uncreative. Oh, he's, he's, uh. Uh, re- reflecting Hoover. Ah, Reflector. there Reflect we go. Reflect to, because you're reflecting back, looking back at what we've just done. This is like, if I could get like slightly philosophical for a moment, and anybody who's been listening to this show for any amount of time has probably heard me do this, getting philosophical. I think actually milestones and marking time is an important thing. Like ritual has its, its use and, you know, graduation and birthdays, starting a new job, completing a, a chapter in something I think is worth taking a moment and ha- taking a breath and going like, hey, look, we're doing something here. And so we both agreed that what we should do for this episode is take a break from the regular numbering of uh, episode to episode and talking about specific episodes. But like, look back, we just finished talking about all of season one. Let's look at season one and to start with I and mean, we're gonna go in a lot of places today i think a lot of places but i think to start with i wondered if we could try to characterize our experience watching season one versus later seasons without going into too much detail later seasons because that's mm-hmm. to come i think we've covered this here and there throughout the first 16 episodes of the show but i think like collecting this in one little mini discussion i think would be interesting mm-hmm. Because you are just younger enough than me that I think our interaction with the show might be a little bit different when we were kids. Yeah, I'm, I think, a year and a half younger than you. Which, when you're 10, that makes a difference, yeah. right? Like, there's a big difference between, like, 8 and 10. Yeah. And so I remember a, a big difference for me in watching season one is that, like, it was very happenstance kind of like chance played a lot into it. Like the fact that like my first encounter with it, like I didn't get up specifically to see it. I was just watching cartoons and it happened to come across my radar Mm. or radar. I saw it. I saw it on the screen and then it turned into, Oh, when is that coming out again? I don't remember always having an up-to-date TV guide in the house when I was a kid. Mm. Do do we need to explain what a TV guide is? (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) Okay. So, like, I remember, like, to the best of my memory, I remember inferring that, okay, it was on at this time. Uh, I I do remember that comic books would have, like, a center spread when Mm -hmm. we were kids with, like, a Saturday morning lineup. Like, Spider-Man and his amazing friends on it, like, 8 a.m. on Saturday, you know? Yeah. So I remember using that, at least, as a guide to help me figure it out. But at some point, I figured out it was, like, 7 a.m. on Saturdays. And like that was like the, the first time in my life where I'm like, I'm setting an alarm I'm, and I'm going to get up and I'm going to watch it. But we didn't have a VCR what, or if we did, I didn't know how to use it mm. when I was first watching it. So I didn't start recording the series and really like showing up with like a serious intent of like I'm capturing the show and I'm experiencing it and I'm like, you know, I'm like pouring myself this cereal or getting this kind of snack and grabbing my swoop action figure and sitting in front of the TV to really, you know, be a part of this experience. That didn't happen until, like, I think season two. Season one, it felt more like it was much more of a casual and based on chance kind of experience. What about you? 
Well, I definitely was the type of kid who would pour over the local TV listings. Oh, really? Not the TV guide itself, but the version we got with the newspaper every day. <laughs> so it was... <laughs> Two technologies that no longer exist. <laughs> right. please, please don't make us explain what a newspaper is. But... <laughs> But I remember like pouring over it, like seeing, <laughs> okay, what cartoons are, are out and when are they and everything, which is weird because, I mean, it was just for viewing them at the time because around this time I still wasn't knowledgeable about working the VCR. But I definitely taped Spider-Man and his amazing friends off the TV, so that would have been around this time. Okay. But I don't remember. It took me a while to start taping Transformers, like in its initial run. I don't think I even thought about it until season two. Probably once I started taping other shows, I was like, hey, I should probably tape this show. I imagine in the beginning, getting my parents to buy blank videotapes is probably harder and then it just became sort of a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas you were in a video store, it was probably very typical to have videotapes and stuff. But the video store didn't come along until I was like 12 or 13. Ah, okay. So at this point, we just had a VCR, and mm. I think I remember having to lean on my parents, like, get me you know, <laughs> a, one of those 12 hour long play cassettes. Remember how they would have like the, you could have like, if you record in, in different speeds, mm -hmm. you could. It was um, two, four, or six SP. Yeah. LP or SLP and sometimes called EP. Yeah, that's right. SLP. Yeah. And and so I would get the, the, the tapes that would if you recorded an SLP or EP, you get six hours on a tape. The video quality was not super awesome, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was it was serviceable for right. what it was. But yeah. And, and yeah, there was that the, this idea that back then when the show was over, if you didn't videotape it, you had no guarantee of ever seeing it again. Yep. And not not to get like, you know, barefoot uphill both ways in the snow kind of uh, storytelling. But I think that that kind of played into how I emotionally interacted with the show in season mm. one. So, uh, something I've, I've, I've reported on a lot through the first 16 episodes of the show is that those cliffhangers before the commercials really emotionally affected me. Like I felt like when when uh, Skyfire says you must be destroyed and it goes to black, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. Mm -hmm. Or when Grimlock is like, you know, I'm going to kill Optimus Prime, I'm like, oh my gosh. Partially because I think partially because like this is the only time I was ever going to see this story. Mm -hmm. That's how it felt. I don't think I would say that aloud, but that was definitely part of the dynamic. Like, and and the story that I always tell that that sort of describes this this feeling is. There was an advertisement on television. That there was a new cartoon that was going to be playing, and it was—I think it was playing in the evening. It had to have been. It was Max Steel's Robo Force, mm -hmm. and it was like, oh, it's like a cartoon special that's happening in the, after, in the evening. And you remember, like, cartoons on at night was kind of a big deal. Yeah. You know? You'd hear that that CBS special thing that happened with the bongo drums. <laughs> 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 and we'd be like, oh, man, something's going to happen, you know. And so this was an instance where it's like I wrote it down. It's like I saw the commercial. I'm like, OK, it's going to be on a Wednesday at six or whatever. <laughs> and that night, and it's not like you tell your parents, like, mom, dad, OK, like clear the slate, six o'clock Wednesday. You know, it's like you just assume you're going to be at home. Well, my dad had to go visit some friend of his and he wanted to bring the whole family. <laughs> And I'm like, but dad, no, you don't understand. Robo-Force. <laughs> it's a special event, dad. They said on TV, special. You see that? I wrote it down in red crayon, special event. <laughs> and, and it's and it's robots. You know, I need to watch the robots. You know how I am about them. And he's like, he's like, no, sorry, we're going. And I'm like, well, I'll just watch it at your friend's house. He's like, no, you're not. You're not going to go to my friend's house and turn on his TV to watch your show when we're supposed to be socializing. I'm like, so you're trading my special event. <laughs> We're sitting around with a bunch of grown-ups and talking about grown-up stuff. I'm 10, you know? That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> and then I was so angry. And, like, this anger persisted for years because, like, I never got to see it. It never played again. And this is, like, long before YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, it wasn't until I want to say, like, I want to say eight or nine years ago that our mutual friend Sean Robert was like, Jersey, Jersey, I found the Robo Force <laughs> special on YouTube. Welcome to the Brandon in the 80s podcast. And and like it was, it was almost like I was like, Dad, I forgive you. <laughs> and I went and I and I got a giant burrito uh, from like a takeout place, 
And I told Anne, I picked her up from work, my wife, and I'm like, clear the slate. You know, we're not doing anything else. The next 21 minutes, it's just going to be me and this cartoon. It's a special event again. It's a spe- <laughs> again. <laughs> But like the point of that story is like that was like part of the tension that was happening when these cartoons would, would be on the screen. It's like I'm never gonna get to do this again. And so you know, it, it, I think it raised the stakes for me in general on mm-hmm. season one. Season two rolls around. It's like okay, I know when it's on now. It's advertised every afternoon on it was yeah. WSMH TV sixty six UHF station. <laughs> And like so, they they told me like every day at four Transformers. Okay, well now it does, and, and plus I'm recording it, so now mm-hmm. it feels a little less. There's less anxiety around the watching event, and so yeah. I, I I think like the stakes felt lower as a result mm-hmm. of it. Most definitely, because by '85 it was a phenomenon. Yeah, you know we're not even exaggerating here. It was the exciting toy line. Mm-hmm. So just that change that transformation if you will oh that's good (laughs) from from this new mysterious cartoon for season one to worldwide phenomenon in season two that made all the difference and it changed the kind of storytelling they did i believe Mm -hmm. it definitely changed the availability of the toys so there is a very clear distinction between season one and season two and like we talked about last time in heavy metal war how it almost seems kind of dumbed down Mm -hmm. i wonder if that was part of it like some business suit steps in says look this is really taken off you guys are doing a great thing here but you guys need to dumb it down this is for kids Mm -hmm. this is selling millions and millions of dollars of toys but dial it back a little quit talking about characters uh, shooting off and into space and never making it back (laughs) you know stop talking about that kind of stuff (laughs) remember these are for seven-year-olds so or 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 even younger right like we got to reach five-year-olds yeah you know so i feel like somebody probably stepped in and did that because while there are certainly some great episodes in season two the overall feel of them it's like we sort of go from a young adult novel to a intermediate reader's novel yeah i was thinking about that as i was looking at some of the episodes we're about to talk about is that there's a lot of stories where it's like oh if you just change this word to that it Mm -hmm. would be the story would make a lot of sense and it would have a lot of gravitas or whatever it would would feel like the stakes really high and Mm -hmm. really intense but when you change that word to this word it suddenly makes it more accessible to to like seven-year-olds but it makes the the prospect or the concept behind this episode kind of silly, mm-hmm. right? And like, there, there's a line of dialogue in the next episode we're going to talk about where it's like, oh god, what a weird line of dialogue that is. <laughs> but I see why you did it because if you say what you're really trying to say with like the real words, it's too heavy duty. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I think you're right. It feels at least at the very least, all we can say is like what we detect and what we are detecting is that somehow they realize that a lot of people are looking at this there's a there's a lot of money to be made if we broaden the audience on this so let's like make it a little bit more accessible to younger kids yeah it really feels that way yeah and just to talk about like the cartoon climate at the time while i did not live in the sticks like jersey did i lived in a small city Mm -hmm. so unfortunately it's it seems like we only got the biggest of the cartoons i remember like constantly being frustrated because almost all the time, it seemed. Spider-Man and his amazing friends, I believe it would air at 10.30 in the morning on Saturdays, at least from the time I was taping it. I want to say that was the time, but regardless, it would almost always be preempted by some sort of Dallas Cowboys football show. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just remember being so angry whenever uh-huh. that would happen. <laughs> yes, because I had zero interest in sports. And I lived oh. in Texas, and back then it was all about the Oilers in Houston and the Cowboys in Dallas. Yeah. So quite often they would have some sort of sports-related show that would just you know, come on, right when Spider-Man was supposed to come on, because I believe Spider-Man was always the last cartoon, at least for a while. So sometimes they would just decide to come on early, and sorry, we're not airing Spider-Man. So not only was there (laughs) that, that was like my first experience with being frustrated 
about cartoon airings. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And also, it's like, we got the big stuff. We got He-Man, we got Transformers, and we got G.I. Joe. Like, those were the big three. But did we get... You didn't get Thundercats, did you? We did not get Thundercats. Wow. We did not get Silverhawks. Wow! At, at least not in their initial run. I think... I th- Well, we may have gotten Silverhawks at, like, some weird time. Like mm-hmm. at eight in the morning on a weekday or something, where I would have been in yeah. school. But we did not get Shira at all, wow. to my knowledge, ever. Wow. Yeah. So it's like you talked about seeing advertisements in comic books for these shows. I would see them and get all excited, and then I could never find them. Oh wow! And and I was oh. pouring over that TV listings from the newspaper too. I was looking <laughs> everywhere, and they weren't there. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Because like what you're describing is like what happened, I want to say, like the year I turned like 11 and 12. Like those mm-hmm. years were like I was almost like an archivist. I'm like I have to c- collect and consume <laughs> all of it. Yeah. And I wasn't even thinking like to preserve it for future generations. It was more like for me, I need right. all this so that I will always ha- be able to go back to it. And it's never going to slip through my fingers again like RoboForce did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Another thing that I think about about season one versus the, the later seasons is, and we've we've talked about this in the first 16 episodes as well, is how surprised I was to revisit this and really contend with the fact that this, relatively speaking, even to its contemporaries at the time, it was a serious show. It was mm-hmm. taking itself seriously. It had, I wouldn't say a grim, dark attitude, but it wasn't shying away from the fact that we're really talking about a war, between good and evil, they say that, but they they show that the characters are more complex than that. I mean, mm-hmm. Starscream is a greedy child, but like Soundwave loves his tapes, you know. Yeah, they weren't all painted with the same evil brush, so to speak. Right. There was diversity even among the villains, and yet there was no shying away from the fact that Chip's working in a munitions plant to develop weapons, like more effective weapons to repel these mm-hmm. alien invaders, and. The world at large knows about these creatures, yeah. you know. They make posters that say, the enemy. The enemy. And I have to say, like, as a grown-up, I really, like, when I find out, like, like, they're doing a new Transformers series, the first thing I think of is, like, I hope it's fun. I just really hope that kids can access it, and I hope that it's really, like, joyful and fun in mm-hmm. the way it's approached. But at the same time, I don't know if I would have been into Transformers as much as I was, if it didn't have that serious tone. Right. I think it was very unusual for the time. You know, we were used to super friends. Yeah. Super friends. Well, see, you talked about like how the things you didn't have access to for some reason, WSMH TV 66, they, they were like, Hey, um, we got a call from this kid in central Michigan who really, really loves cartoons. How many do we got? How many do you want? (laughs) (laughs) And it was like every morning at, I think it started at 5. AM. I want to say they would play cartoons every weekday. Like, I could watch Galaxy Rangers, Challenge of the Gobots, Sky Commanders, and then go to school. Wow. Um, See, it seemed like my area was, like, all into the classics. Like, here's mm Scooby-Doo. And and then, like, they started to branch out a little around 83, 84, where I would get things like Plastic Man and Super Friends. And uh, it just seems like the preference for the higher-ups at the local TV stations were the the old school type of silly zany animal cartoons okay yeah i remember that in like the early 80s like the afternoon block of animation was like scooby-doo i forget what other ones it were but it was always like it was like sleuthing kids and like a anthropomorphic character right like, uh <laughs> that Jabber was the template that they had yeah. about 7800 shows of <laughs> But see, there was this afternoon where, and this is this is like really like how I've come to learn a lot of things in my life is this particular habit I have. It's like I was looking at the TV and I noticed there was two knobs, you know, and I asked somebody, probably my parents, <laughs> I'm like, what's the second knob for? And like, oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other channels you can look for, but there's nothing there. I'm like, well. Let's see, you know, and I literally one <laughs> afternoon I'm, I'm out of school. I'm sitting in front of the TV and I'm clicking that second knob and it had like so many numbers on it. Right. Like the top knob. When we were kids, you had three stations, maybe four. Right. <laughs> like we had ABC, NBC, CBS and then PBS. So anyone under 20, you're blowing their minds right now. Yeah, well, yeah, I know. I know I'm starting to like talk like Grandpa Simpson. You know, we wore an onion <laughs> on our belt, which was a style at the time. Man um, yells at cloud. 
<laughs> but that second knob had like literally like 60 or 70 numbers on it right yeah. and so i'm clicking through one at a time and like it's nothing but static 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 and then honest and for true i click i get to channel 66 i don't know that there's a channel 66 i'm not looking <laughs> in the newspaper and transor z is on which uh. is like the american import version of mazinger mazinger z i think and i'm like what 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 is this it's robots you know and so now, you know, it was like, it was the afternoon block of animation. So like after that, that was, and, and I don't know why my, the rest of my family was so compliant about this, but like after school from like 2.30 PM till what was it? Like 6 PM is that's when What's <laughs> Happening came on. <laughs> hey, I would, Rod. <laughs> and like I, when that music started, I'm like, okay, you can turn the TV off now. <laughs> See that, that for me was Barney Miller. Oh. <laughs> I think sometime around this time, it was actually WGN in, out of Chicago was where I watched okay. Transformers and G.I. Joe. And I think it went G.I. Joe at 4, Transformers at 4.30. And then I think like something I didn't watch. And then I just sort of like messed around for a half hour. And I think WKRP in Cincinnati came on at 5.30. And then it was Barney Miller. Whenever I heard that bass line that now yeah, I, I know the theme song awesome. you're talking about. But back then, it just signified, yeah. okay, I can turn the TV off. Now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. It was like, oh, is it live action? I'm done. <laughs> it really was as simple as that. It was like, I wasn't even going to give it a chance. I just, live action, why would you watch it? Why would you watch people talking about stuff? That's weird. But yeah, yeah. So like, I, I just discovered it just by just out of curiosity. How, what, what, why is this knob there? <laughs> and then that became like the only time in my my childhood where I really asserted myself. <laughs> Like, I don't care what you do, but that time, that's mine. I get the TV, and I did. So You got to stand up for what's important when you're eight years old. <laughs> so what about um, some realizations? Like, this is something else we've talked about on the show over the first season, is like things that we've realized over the years about the show between our experience engaging with as a child versus like now that we are swimming in information about how these things get made. Yeah. It's really interesting how now that the internet age is here, you know, certain things come out that we would have had no access to or no clue about. And one of which is like storyboards that have uh, come out over the years for these shows that, you know, we would have had zero access to seeing these back in the day, you know, unless somebody was going to, like, make yeah. a book about them, which they definitely weren't, we would have just not been able to see these. But now, like, we come across these online these days, and some of them show, like, scenes that never got put into the show. So we finally get to find out, like, oh, that's why this episode seems so awkward or, or why their pacing was all over the place. It's like there was going to be these other 23 scenes that they were going to somehow cram in there. So just the best example of which I can think of is in Heavy Metal War when Megatron has the powers of all his other Decepticons. In the original storyboards, they actually have Megatron turn into a jet during the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of would have tipped his hand, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Of course, the way Prime was acting in that episode, it wouldn't have tipped his hand at all. Prime just would have been, I had no idea he had a jet alt mode as well. <laughs> I guess I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> that's, what have, that's how it would have been written, you're right. <laughs> then he turns to Bumblebee, did you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he's like quit asking me <laughs> oh my gosh but yeah thankfully you know someone stepped in and said uh that's not how this is working yeah and so that didn't ever happen but just little facts like that you know sprinkle out via the internet there's also a youtube channel called transformers at the moon yeah which posts a lot of audio cutscenes from season one of transformers like basically the entirety of season one and season one only, there are lots of lines of dialogue that are either sort of expanded on from the show or just 
completely cut scenes in general. It's really fun to listen to, especially if you're reacquainting yourself with the show, because there's a lot of scenes that just did not show up at all. Like there's one, I think in uh, More Than Meets the Eye Part 3, when Thundercracker and Skywarp are gathering up rubies from the crystal mines, where Megatron really like yells at them both, and that didn't make it into the show at all. Mm. So just, just little scenes like that, little really interesting character development pieces sometimes that we just never were made aware of until this person, you know, came across them and put them up online for all to enjoy. I I think that's another thing that characterizes my relationship, at least mine, and you can weigh in on how, how you feel about this, but because information about the thing was so hard to get to and especially mm-hmm. growing up where i did where like i didn't get to go to big toy stores very often like like literally in like that time of my childhood it was like once a year we got to go to toys r us and you know it's like it's not like i had like a really great information network i had like you know 25 schoolmates you know mm-hmm. yeah so like a lot of of what I knew about the show was inferred through just staring at package art for a long time, yep. like looking at that image. Mm-hmm. I think one of the reasons that that back of the package image is so iconic is because so many of us sat and just stared at it, wondering what all that stuff was. Yeah. So like when I think of season one in particular, I think of there's really in my childhood mind, there's a kind of an exotic, mysterious quality about that particular season. Mm hmm. Which I'm not going to try to place a value judgment on like whether that's better or worse, but I do wonder if I had access to all this information I have now about how it was made back then, mm-hmm. how would that have changed my relationship with the, the property? I don't know. I mean, it's impossible to say. Right. Because when something is a little bit more mysterious, we, you know, we sort of spend more time with it, sort of mentally trying to wrap our minds around this thing. And if it was you know, so out there and available and presented in a very unmysterious way, you know, maybe it wouldn't have been so captivating. I don't know. I mean, I, I would be interested in talking with some young people. I, I teach comics classes, so I, this would be something I can follow up with my students is like, for the kids who are like, I am so into Wreck-It Ralph, you know, and then you get the DVD and it's got all these, <laughs> you know, little mini things like documentaries and things in there showing how it's made mm-hmm. and everything. How does it make you feel about the thing? Does it make you like more interested or does it s- sort of satiate you? You know, it's like, OK, I don't need to think about Wreck-It Ralph anymore. Right. I don't know. I don't know. But at the very least, I think it's worth just noting that like our lack of access to information about the thing, at least in in my case, it made it feel like it was this dynamic, mysterious, exotic thing that comes from, like, I didn't even, like, as somebody who wanted, who knew he wanted to make comics when he was 11 years old, like, I put the comic down, I'm like, I gotta do that. <laughs> I had no idea what these people looked like, mm-hmm. you know, what, what was, the, what, what was, it, how did you make a comic? Well, you draw, that's all. Well, there's more to yeah. it than that, obviously. And so, you know, I had these pictures in my head without even knowing it of what all these, like what, who, what George Perez looked like or what Steve Lee Aloha looked like. And it was like Michelangelo's painting on the top of the Sistine Chapel of God creating Adam. It was like this mm-hmm. long flowing white beard. They were clearly very old men because anybody over 20 is very old. And they all have really <laughs> long white hair and long white beards like like Zeus in Clash of the Titans, <laughs> you know. And it wasn't until I like went to my one of my first conventions and saw George Perez with his Hawaiian shirt and everything. I was like, oh, he's just a dude, <laughs> you know. But like, and, it, and I didn't realize that I had that image in my head until the moment I got to see him in person, you know. <laughs> but it was because like I had to fill in a lot of blanks as a child, and yeah. so like certain things become more exotic through the window of a child's imagination and, mm-hmm. and lack of context. And speaking of child's imagination, we can't leave out talking about the tech specs and file cards on the Mm. back of the packages Mm -hmm. which were a large help in sort of teaching us about these characters like not only did you get this great toy who was two different things at once but on the back of the package we got to learn about that character and what he was like Mm -hmm. you know how good was his laser fire you know like yeah like how how brave was he you know we had all these stats just lined up for us yeah. And the packaging was just phenomenal. I mean, everything about it was great. I mean, you'll see these days fans really get excited when the old style packaging is recreated. Not only is it nostalgic for us, but I mean, the way that was set up and everything was just so good. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to get in like a fight. Like, I don't want to say, oh, transformer packaging these days is lame or anything like that. I don't, you know, I just think it was done very well back in the 80s. So you had, I mean, I can weigh in as the artist between the two of us, right? It's like you have this really very 80s ish, late 70s, early 80s ish sort of chromish robot, all airbrushed. But yeah. it's, but they're always in this super dynamic pose. Like there's always forced perspective on the earth. Well, actually, on all the G1 toys. Like they're always like either a leg is coming at you or an arm is coming at you. But it's always something where it's like there's like a lot of energy in the pose itself, right? So mm-hmm. there's that. There's an arresting image. It's shiny, it's chrome. It's dynamic. And then you got that cool science fiction grid with like either a red gradient for Autobots, purple gradient for Decepticons. You got the color coding. You could tell they called this the squint test in art. If you can squint at it and still make out what it is, then it's a good uh, design. You know, it's so like you can squint at a toy aisle and see like, OK, there's the Decepticons over there. You know? <laughs> the logo changed whether it was an Autobot or Decepticon. Right. Like it would say Transformers yeah. and like the mm-hmm. symbol next to the word trans would reflect what allegiance it was. Mm-hmm. So there was like a lot of thoughtful stuff put into that and then like yes you flip it over and there's this painting of a space battle like with everybody fighting each other and then underneath that it'll have like if it's like the mini bots like instructions on how to transform them with like cool drawings of the robot in various states of transformation and then yes you have like this tech spec thing and for for those who never got to open these old toys there was a red a uh, little piece of red cellophane <laughs> that the tech specs, the, the the readouts of their abilities was a blue line that was obscured by a bunch of red scribbles over top of it. And if you really looked, you could see it. You could see the blue line. <laughs> but but it, it was cool because it was like, it's been encrypted. And, you know, right. it's like, because we don't want the Decepticons to find out. <laughs> and you take this little red piece of cellophane, put it over the, the tech spec area, and then you could see what their powers and abilities are. So it had a little bit of that decoder ring kind of feel to it, you know? Yeah. And then, yes, you had just enough information on the tech spec to launch your imagination. Here's the picture of the character, again, from the front of the card, and then it has their name. It has a a motto, like an expression that is in sort of in their voice, right? And Mm. then, then it would have their primary function. What's their purpose in life? Right. Holy cow. We've talked about this a bunch of times. Like when I was a kid, it mesmerized me how effortless life looked from the from the perspective of a kid looking at an adult doing things. They just do stuff and they know how to do it. <laughs> and it all works. You know, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing any given moment of the day, you know, but they got it all figured out. And to like have that purpose, like stated that way, is like that is compelling. And then a paragraph explaining what their abilities are and what also fascinated me as a child is that they all had some kind of weakness too there was something mm-hmm. that like made it difficult for them to do what they do so all the packaging told you a story to like get you started imagining I, i've heard arguments sometimes that like putting all that information on a toy sometimes like hamstrings a kid's imagination because now they can't do whatever they want uh, I think that's cutting kids short because I knew plenty of kids who played with their G.I. Joes, their He-Mans, and their Transformers all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> they had no problem making that leap. Like, I had a friend growing up, he was an only child, and he had zero problems crossing the fandoms. Like, He-Man knew Optimus Prime. They were just friends, that's all. And one thing I definitely want to point out was a friend of mine who was very ahead of their time. As a kid, I knew precisely one girl who was into Transformers, mm. and her name was Samantha. And one time I got to go over to her house and she amazed me by, I mean, I knew she was into Transformers at this point, but she amazed me by revealing that she would cut the front off of the boxes and save that picture. Oh, wow. The art of the robot that you got in this box, I never thought to keep them. I did think to keep the tech spec Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, all the file cards and all that sort of thing. But I never saved the front of the package. And then when I saw that she had done it, I was like, oh, I should have been doing this the whole time. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's awesome that you knew a girl who was into the Transformers. Because like one thing that I think that doesn't travel well into the 21st century is it was really promoted as a boy's toy. And mm-hmm. there was, I wouldn't Everything say. Everything was segregated back then. It really was, and unnecessarily so. Mm-hmm. It, it's like I can't remember if I told this story on the show or not, but like one of the first action figure lines I ever got into, and this is like first grade, was Strawberry Shortcake. Mm. I loved Strawberry Shortcake. I thought it was 
if I were to try to put words to what was going on in my head was there was they were super colorful. They mm-hmm. all had unique personalities and outfits. And, and they smelled great. And they smelled good, right? Like there was something kind of like really compelling about like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a playing experience where my nose is involved. You know? <laughs> It's weird. I've never done this before, but it, but scratches as detailed as Transformers were, our noses never got involved. Right, right. Like and and like scratch and sniff stickers for crying out loud. So why yep. not? And I remember I was going first grade. I'm like, I'm gonna go to show and tell today, and I'm taking my strawberry shortcake. And mm-hmm. like my brothers were like, dude, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a kid like that in my class who did that for his My Little Ponies. Ah, so he was probably one of the first bronies ever to exist see and, and yeah even the word brony kind of bums me out because it's like well why does yeah. it have to even be worth noting you know right but i think honestly i think that word is now sort of i mean it still has a meaning of course mm-hmm. but i feel like that was sort of the last ah sort of like the last what do you call it when something like the last death rattle of, of yeah. inherent sexism yeah. in, in toy yes. uh, yes. uh, promotion. Yes, well put. <laughs> like, like now post My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, I feel like everything is intended for everyone. Like yeah. it's only been in the past couple years that, you know, with new characters like Rey in Star Wars, you know, that they've really had like Star Wars dolls that are available, you know, and they sort of like... I don't want to say like market them to girls, but clearly there are franchises now that the toys are marketed towards basically everyone at this point. Like even WWE, there were dolls of the female WWE superstars made just a few years ago, and they were, you know, placed in the girl aisle of Toys R Us, quote unquote. Quote unquote. Well, yeah. I, I think I feel like somebody's going to well actually us. So like, let's just like stipulate that neither of us are marketing experts and we no. don't have access to the conversations that have been going on at these toy companies. But I think it is worth saying that both of us, I think you'd agree, we feel like, yeah, it's a drag that it was at the time it was being promoted when we were kids that it was like, yeah, it's only for boys. Right. Girls go, yeah. Go with, yeah. Um, because I wanted to get a she doll because she was He-Man's sister. I mean, yeah. I didn't even get the show. Yeah. But if this is He-Man's sister, I should be involved. Because, <laughs> you know, I had, like, all the He-Man characters. So it's yeah. like, well, why don't I get this one, too? And then my mom didn't refuse, but she, she inferred to me that it probably wasn't a good idea that I get a she doll. So I left Walmart that day bummed out. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember having similar conversations with my family when I was growing up about stuff like this. Because, yeah, there was another scented line of dolls called Rose Petal Place. Or Rose oh, Petal. yeah, yeah. Long ago at Rose Petal Place, a teardrop brought flowers to life. Yeah, and, like, uh, my sister got one of the figures, and it came with a tape that told a little story about the characters. And I was like, why aren't my Transformers mm. coming with tapes like this that tell me a story? <laughs> and and I listened to the tape. I'm like, this sounds like a cool story. You know, there's, like, this mean spider named Nastina, and she's got, like, this guy called Horace Fly that she pushes around. And <laughs> But it's like, when I was growing up, what made it good to me was whether or not it was a good story and an interesting design. Mm. But I was, by the time I was 12, I was painfully aware of that kind of like grouping and, and bucketing that they did. Like, well, this is for boys and this is for girls. And if you like yeah. this thing that's for girls, you shouldn't talk about it with your friends too much. And that's a drag. Yeah. Um, I feel like that really doesn't kind of exist much anymore. I mean, it, it's at, less. Or at least not to that degree. Yeah. Thank goodness. Like, I remember when this is talking about a different Transformer series, but when Transformers Prime came out, both of us were like, eh, it's okay. We like tried a little bit. And then all of a sudden you told me, like, look, a lot of my female friends who are in their 20s are super into the show. And I'm like, really? I'm like, okay, let's check it out. Let's find out what's going on with this thing, you know? <laughs> and then we were both like, oh my gosh, this show's amazing, you know? And then finding out that the the comic book series is gaining like a, a wider audience than just, you know, dudes who grew up with the mm-hmm. the original series. And, and for me, like that's always been one of my chips on my shoulders. Like if you're going to reinvent it, always make sure that it's accessible to kids and it's actually accessible to a broad audience. I don't want you to make Transformers for me, meaning my demographic, meaning middle-aged man, right? Mm-hmm. 
there was that special sort of movie that they released for G.I. Joe called G.I. Joe Resolute. Mm -hmm. Came out about 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And they just, they wanted so hard to make it so important and Uh, so grown up and characters died and everyone was angry because it was a war and people were dying and it's like okay come on (laughs) there's toys made for this i mean but but this is one thing to tell sort of adult level stories it's another thing to just make it so incredibly adult that it's so extreme and you know it's like come on that's the that's the weird thing though that I I haven't I'm not done thinking about this I'm I haven't come to like I haven't figured out like what patch of ground I stand on when it comes to this idea because like Gen One first season is very serious there's like relatively speaking not much silly stuff that happens in it right? sure but it's it's not GI Joe Resolute serious okay so I mean it is a thin line to walk but you know it's there's there's some sometimes it seems like a sort of typical you know age 40 fan would be like oh we got to get all that kitty garbage out of this and make it into a real line about war and it's like yeah. no you can make an all ages story that meets the needs of any age and it doesn't have to be exclusively for the 40-somethings. Yeah, I feel like this is what I've been thinking about this a lot with Transformers Prime, too, is like it managed to do a darker story, a more yeah. serious story that still felt like it was appropriate for all ages. And it had like the right kind of amount of fun and joy in it, despite the fact that it is, it, relatively speaking to like all the Transformers series, it's a fairly grim story. Mm-hmm. But there's like a lot of fun stuff that happens in it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very good mix, I would think. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I guess maybe like there's like a, a line. Part of that the line is defined by: Are you taking the material too seriously? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I can only speak to myself, but like a line, I feel like I'm often navigating is: Am I making art or am I am I making an entertainment? And mm-hmm. I try to do both. I'm I'm always keeping my eye on both lanes. Me personally, I don't ever want to fall into one or the other. And I feel like my favorite Transformers iterations walk that line too Mm -hmm. probably more towards entertainment because it is about selling toys after all but speaking of selling toys can we talk about some of the toy buying memories of the yeah so just to set the scene for the era you know 1984 that's the year transformers debuted in toy stores all over and so what was i buying at the time well by 1984 i was pretty much done with star wars yeah the line was still out you know they were still trying to release characters even though the last movie was out and done for over a year they were like surely we can tempt you with imperial dignitary yeah how about that (laughs) b-wing fighter pilot kids I think B-Wing Fighter Pilot was the last figure I ever got in the line if (laughs) if I remember correctly and I was like well I don't have him Yeah, I didn't even have the B-Wing spaceship so it's like I think the fact that they were scraping the bottom of the barrel with these characters at the end sort of made me tap out and I was like okay enough of this I really don't need you know old Anakin Skywalker in ghost form uh, to to set the stage on this one too is like what was it like at that time as far as like Star Wars like presence in our lives Mm-hmm. I have a very clear, distinct memory of visiting my grandparents in New York. My uncle took me to a local grocery store, and it was a grocery store kind of like a Bashes or a Kroger or a a place that is, this is just to sell foodstuffs and maybe a tiny bit of housewares. You can get a spatula, but mostly you're here to get food, right? Yeah. And maybe some pet food. But like, it doesn't have a toy aisle, right? <laughs> And I remember we were walking through the frozen food section, like by the ice cream. And above the frozen food aisle were set up Star Wars action figures on the card, just like up there, like on, <laughs> on pegs. Like, well, while you're getting ice cream, you might need an <laughs> FX7. And it, and I remember being with my Uncle Andy going like, oh, my gosh, there's FX7. <laughs> should, I mean, I, I know you're my uncle, not my dad, but surely you can you can hook me up with an FX7. <laughs> But like, and I remember him groaning, like he did like this really sad groan, which at the time I didn't understand. Cause I'm like, why are you sad? It's FX7. But now that I'm a grown up, I'm like, oh yeah. He was like, I can't get away from this stuff. 
<laughs> so like I could see why you'd be feeling like maybe possibly a little burnt out by it. By the yeah, like, I mean, 83. like back then we, you know, we grew up in an era where Star Wars revolutionized toys for boys at the time. It literally did. I mean, it changed the typical scale we found action figures in from down from eight inches down to three and three quarter inches. And it just, you know, it just revolutionized toys. You know, watch the toys that made us episode of Star Wars for for more information about that. Yeah. So it's like Star Wars was a juggernaut, but by 84, it was dying down. So Mm -hmm. it was like, well, what's going to rise up to replace Star Wars. Well, G.I. Joe had been going since 1982, and I was big into that. Yeah. So that was already two years in. And GoBots, I believe, came out in 83. I was big into those, but they would sell out very quickly in my area. So for at least that first six months or so, I was very lucky to see any of them. Mm. Uh, But my mom would always go shopping during the day and buy me toys while I was at school. Mainly... In retrospect, I think it's because she was trying to be a good parent, but I also think it was almost like a hobby of hers. Like, she didn't have many hobbies of her own, so I think her child became her hobby. Mm, mm, So she would, like, go looking at stores for G.I. Joes I needed or GoBots I needed and stuff like that. Uh, I think it gave her an excuse to get out of the house. (laughs) Okay. But so here in 1984, I was all about G.I. Joe, mostly about GoBots, we never got the cartoon of GoBots in my area, so I didn't have that to sort of reinforce my interest in it. I just liked the concept of GoBots, the robot that turns into a vehicle or some other thing. That yeah. was cool and novel for the time. Oh, yeah. In 1984, I would have also been into Marvel Superhero Secret Wars because I was all about comic books starting around 1983. Yeah. So those toys came out that year. Yeah. So there was room for something else. I still had my literal bucket full of Star Wars figures, but eh, I didn't really care much about them anymore. So there was room for something else. And that something else would have been Transformers. It's like GoBots only existed to warm me up for transforming robot toys. Because once the Transformers were there, it's like, oh, who cares about these dumb GoBots? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talked about this in episode zero, but yeah, I have a very clear memory of like when, you know, I, my mom was going to the store and she's like, oh, I'll get you something. I'm like, OK, well, whatever you do, make sure it's a transformer. Don't you dare bring a GoBot back. Here. <laughs> and, I, and I remember saying like transformers. <laughs> <laughs> Like like when you're talking to somebody who doesn't speak your language and you just get louder and talk slower as if that'll make them understand. Like when Prime uh, says, we're Autobots. <laughs> we come from Cybertron. It's up in sky, far away. Right. So, I, again, my experience was somewhat different in that I didn't get to go to the stores to see what was out there. So, like, my exposure to a lot of these things came by way of other kids bringing stuff to school. Like, mm. I remember the day I discovered there was a 12-inch scale of Star Wars figures, right? <laughs> a kid came to class with a 12-inch Chewbacca who was 15 inches, which might as well have been 100 feet as far as I right. was concerned. He was just so yeah. big. You know, I'm like, they make those? And so it was the same with G.I. Joe where my mom, I was going to a, a friend's birthday party and my mom picked up Destro to give to the kid. <laughs> and that was my first exposure to G.I. Joe. I, I mean, I'd watched the cart. No, I hadn't seen the cartoon yet. And it, she, she gives you this action figure and it says like, oh, Destro, he's part of this organization called Mars. And, and as a kid, I'm like, he's from Mars? <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm just, I just sat and stared at the package for hours before, you know, wrapping it up and taking it to the friend's party. So I'm like, what is this thing? You know, and it was, again, I had to piece together bits of information until I could catch the show. Same thing with GoBots. I didn't know what GoBots were. And maybe this can be a, a transition to talking about like knockoff stuff because also friends would come over with all these other robot toys that were made out of like clearly made out of cheaper material or they were some unrecognizable thing like the uh-huh. first veritech i ever played with was like a cheap knockoff thing that was about maybe four inches tall in robot mode and so obviously it didn't transform like like a proper Ro- veritech you kind of just like mm-hmm. folded it yeah but like there would be these kids just had like they'd come over with their like you know lunchbox full of various robot toys and black star figures like i didn't know you know like those weird little goblins those little hunched over green goblin characters yeah and so 
I would never see these things in their packaging. I would always see them in a, just like a beat up lunchbox when the kids <laughs> would come over. I guess like th- this is a reason like why as an adult I'm more interested in just watching the shows and participating in like discussions about the shows than having like really pristine big collections of any particular line because like my exposure as, as a child was like a couple from each toy line. I never had like a big collection of anything. I always had like a couple of things from various things that I either traded for, with friends or, you know, but that that said, by the time I was a 13 year old, I was super, super into G.I. Joe as well. And my brother and I made a, a deal with each other. That he would only collect the Joes and I would only collect Cobras. <laughs> and so I had a nation. And, yeah, and I don't know why we worked that out. Well, I loved Cobra Commander as a kid, partially because it was Chris Lada. And he was a funny villain, you know, especially in like the later seasons when like, you know, the end of the Pyramid of Darkness, he's like, I, no, I'll never rule the world. I hate this job, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I had exactly one G.I. Joe as a child, and that was Lifeline, which we'll talk huh. more about when we get to season three, when we get to the episode with First Aid. But yeah, yeah, like by the by the time I was a teenager, I had a fairly extensive collection of Cobras. Like I was actually like buying multiple Vipers to like army build <laughs> when I was thirteen years old. That was always a hard sell with parents. You already have this one, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but there's hundreds of them. Yeah, but when I was thirteen, I had an allowance at that point, right? I was I was working at my parents' <laughs> video store. I was working at my parents. Uh, they had like a deli, and then I was also you know babysitting my siblings. And I was like, hey, look. <laughs> we're working something out here. If I'm going to do all this stuff, I get something. <laughs> and so I had like a, a small allowance that I would save up. And then once a week, me and my buddy in middle school would go to Kmart on Sundays and we would go G.I. <laughs> Joe hunting. And yeah, I had like multiple Cobra bats, multiple Cobra vipers, <laughs> which, which it felt like that felt like luxury. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like I had like four vipers. I'm like, I got an army. <laughs> <laughs> What about like uh, some other knockoffs that we saw when we were kids? I kind of got us off of that track, but well, the crazy thing about you know collecting toys back then is, is there was no instructions, there were no rules, there was no information dissemination other than what you saw on the shelves was it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't like, hey, the new G.I. Joe figures are going to start coming out any time. You know, you see these news bits on the Internet these days, but there was none of that back then. Yeah. You, when the new G.I. Joes came out were when you saw them in the store for the first time. And well, there was the commercials. Knew. They would have the commercial when, like, the new G.I. Joe Conquest X-30. True. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it was for, like, a, a big uh, playset or vehicle or something, there would be TV commercials And that was pretty much the sum total of your information about what was coming down the pike. And they usually didn't start airing until the things were already available. So a lot of times you would see them for the first time in the store. Mm -hmm. So back in that sort of 1984 landscape, you know, Star Wars was dying down. Transformers was primed to take over. And, of course, all these other companies wanted some of this GoBots Transformers money. Mm -hmm. So you had all these other robot-changing lines like converters and just all these different ones. (laughs) Z-Bots. All these different lines that basically just imported any Japanese transforming robot toys they could get their hands on. Mm -hmm. You know, brought them over here for American consumption. And as kids, we had no idea... No. that these were like Japanese imports or anything like that. We just like, we saw the Transformer rumble and frenzy. And then while we were at Kmart one day, we saw a rumble and frenzy in different packaging from a different company, but he was white and red. And we're <laughs> like, what is this? This is some sort of weird knockoff. Yeah. They, well, it's, it's like they copied, they cheated. Like yeah. from a kid's perspective, it's just like, you can't do that. That's right. I, I remember a kid down the street. He had the Radio Shack shockwave. <laughs> I forget what the figure was called. It's like one of them was called Galactic Man. That's right, were Galactic like a Man. Few different versions of it. <laughs> I just love that. I love how thoughtless that sounds. Let me call this thing. I don't know, Galactic Man. He's from <laughs> he's from space. Yeah, but is this a man? Look at his legs. I don't know how a man would fit in that. I don't know. It's just, he's he's shaped like a man. 
But yeah, a kid, a kid down the street from me had that the gray Radio Shack Shockwave figure, and I remember it, the, the the emotional journey I went on was like, well, that's not Shockwave. Like that's it's right. like a copy. You got a copy, and then like I immediately felt sad for my friend. I'm like, oh, you you got the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> And what's interesting is another case of information coming out later is that that was a case where the knockoff came first. Yeah, yeah. The quote unquote (laughs) knockoff because it wasn't a knockoff. It was some, you know, independent toy company who came up with that. And then Hasbro comes along and said, you know what? We need some more robot transforming toys in our line. We're going to, you know, lease or buy this model from you. And they were like, okay. So basically Shockwave was the knockoff. Yeah. But as kids, we had no idea. No. You know, we just saw that it wasn't an actual Transformer and just made an assumption that that must be some horrible, cheating knockoff. Like, Mm. I remember being a kid, I was out shopping with my cousin at some toy store. Some, like, I think it was sort of not like a mall toy store or anything, but like a privately owned type of toy store. And they had what I clearly determined to be Reflector from the Transformers cartoon, Mm. which was weird because the Reflector toy didn't exist in the Transformers toy line. But what other three robots are going to turn into a camera? This had to be Reflector. Right, right. So I convinced my cousin to get him. (laughs) So, and I'm pretty sure this was even before you could order a reflector from Hasbro via the mail-in stuff. Okay. So, to me, this was baffling because clearly this was reflector, but it wasn't in Transformers packaging or anything. So, what in the world was going on? You know, it's like back then we didn't have any way to get these answers. No, and we only had a kid's perspective about how the world worked, right? Yeah. All we knew was don't copy off the kid next to you. You know, <laughs> D- don't cheat when you're playing sports, you know, yeah. don't lie and don't misrepresent, you know? And so like when we would see that, it would just be like, Hey, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> right. like, and like, who are we defending? You know, it's like, it's just like, but that's not the right one. It's not, it's not, somebody must be cheating. You know, <laughs> All I, that's, that's the only way I understand justice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And similarly baffling were the red bumblebees you could get and the yeah. yellow cliff jumpers. Yeah. Come to find out that Hasbro just did that intentionally just so they could get some more toys out there real quick. Yeah. But at the time, I was like, how did they mess this up? He's red on the package yeah. and there's this yellow cliff jumper. It's like, boy, this, this must be a mess up. I don't want that one. Yeah. My very first Transformer was Windcharger and my little brother got Bumblebee. And Bumblebee was red. He got a red Bumblebee. And, I, and we, I remember us sitting on the steps of the school playing with our toys and just expressing utter bewilderment. Like, why is the drawing of Bumblebee yellow? And, and like, I think at this point we hadn't seen the cartoon yet. We'd only seen those animated commercials. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then, like, the show starts. It's like, well, wait a second. Bumblebee is yellow. What's going on here? You know, but, like, yeah, you don't. And what are you going to do? You could ask Dad. Hey, Dad, right. how, come, how come this is the wrong? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Leave me alone, son. I literally just got you this so you would be quiet for five minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> From a kid's standpoint, it's like it's like one of the greatest mysteries. This is like Indiana Jones level of, you know, right. we, we, we've got to go on a quest to find out what, what's the story behind this. Yeah, just like uh, who we now know as Bumper. Oh, yeah. Initially, it was called Bumble Jumper Bumble because Jumper. he was kind of like Bumblebee, kind of like Cliff Jumper, but neither of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What about the rub off sticker, which was like, that was like the Transformers answer to the knockoffs, right? Because I, I remember being yeah. like, always look for the rub off sticker. I will. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the commercial told us to, so we did. We are conquerors. No one is like us. Only we have the right to be called by the name. Only we have the right to wear this symbol. Or this symbol. Only we are Autobots and Decepticons. Good versus evil. And only we have the right to be called the Transformers. Or the Transformers. Only the Transformers are real Transformers. These sold separately from Hasbro. <laughs> and those got debuted or debuted. They debuted with the mini spies, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, those were basically really junky little one-step transformers that were even dinkier than the minibots. Yeah. So, like, they came free with, like, one of, I think, four different molds and four different colors mm. of these quote-unquote mini spies. And the whole gist of the thing, based on the commercial, was you had to rub the sticker to see what their allegiance was. Right, right, that's right. It's like a car goes into Autobot headquarters, transforms into robot mode, and it starts messing around with Teletram 1. And then, like, Cliff Jumper <laughs> comes in... Yeah. And he turns back into a car, and the cliff jumper's like, wait a second. It goes up to his hood, <laughs> rubs his hand on the hood, and then he sees the Decepticon. And so he's like, it's a Decepticon! <laughs> and then it starts to get away, like drives away. He's like, get him! In the world of the Transformers, it used to be easy to tell the Autobots from the Decepticons. But now, the mini-spies are on the loose. They look like Autobots, but are they? It's a Decepticon! After him! Transformer Mini Spies. You get one with each of the six Autobot mini car packages. Motorized Transformers. You can't tell if they're Autobots or Decepticons until you rub up their symbol. It's an Autobot! Transformer Mini Spies. Get them while supplies last from Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> what a concept. I mean, obviously, they, they just wanted a way to identify their Transformers as authentic. And they thought, you know, hey, this technology exists where if you change the heat level around this sticker, you know, this thing that previously wasn't visible shows up. You know, it's kind of like those coffee mugs that they do these days. Mm -hmm. They start out black, but you put coffee in them and then they say like, I'm nothing without my coffee or whatever you coffee people (laughs) like to say. I like how you, you, this this thinly veiled contempt toward, <laughs> toward coffee drinkers. Oh, um, was it thinly veiled? I'm sorry. Let me thicken that up. <laughs> um, but also, I think it's worth stopping on the fact that that technology at the time, like that kind of mood ring color change technology, felt very futuristic. <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. That my, was another mysterious new thing that got lumped in with these Transformers. It's like, wow, I can change the look of this sticker by just putting my warm finger on it. Yeah. My parents had a thermometer that was made out of that technology that you would, it was just like a strip that you put on your forehead and then it would like the number of what your temperature was would like, would be, would show up in that color, you know, like it would change color to, you know, it's (laughs) 98.9. And I I just remember playing with that all the time. Like, how does it work? You know, (laughs) like there's no wires. It's just a piece of plastic and I touch it. It changes color. I put that thermometer on my head and it said evil Decepticon. <laughs> and the cliff jumper chased you out of the building. <laughs> but like that and like the, the, the color changing of Zartan and like the yeah. you know, Zoran and Xander, like that, all that stuff felt really like, oh, we are living in the Star Trek future. <laughs> right. I have a toy that I put in the sun and it turns blue. What have you got? <laughs> Past? Nothing. That's what you've got. <laughs> So we kind of blew past it, but what were the very first Transformers you ever owned? Well, like I said, the very first one I got was Wind Charger, and my brother got Bumblebee, and I remember we traded. This happened a couple times in our childhood where like our parents <laughs> got us something. We were like, oh, thanks, and then we instantly traded. Because <laughs> like, one Easter, and I don't know why, Like, did you get action figures for Easter? Oh, yes, very much so. So I did a couple times, and one year my parents got my brother, Cobra Commander, and me, Firefly, and it was literally like it happened right in front of my parents. Like, thank you so much that we just traded for, without even <laughs> opening you know it's like you got us the wrong ones by the way elliot likes all the ninjas and i like the the you know the guys with the silver faces but um <laughs> same thing happened where we're like we're sitting there playing with them like hey you want to trade yeah i want to trade you got the sports car yeah but you got the cute brave guy i like him <laughs> and then I, I it was mostly mini bots for me i don't remember getting like a full-sized uh you know full size what would they call that now um well Sideswipe level, they called them in the catalog Autobot cars. Okay. Actually, I don't think I ever got an Autobot car growing up. Mm. One birthday, I got Skywarp, and that felt like a big deal. Like, Yeah. But most of the Transformers cars that came through my life were through trading. You know, I had Jazz for a little while. I had Prowl. Oh, I lo- I wanted Prowl so bad. <laughs> I, I just thought he was looked like the coolest cop car in the whole world. And, of course, Optimus. You know, I traded with some kids to, like, have Optimus for a while. But, yeah, mostly it was it was mostly minibots until I was, like, again, 13. By that time, I had my own money to spend, and so I started. Mm. Uh, oh, Swoop. I did get Swoop one Christmas and Blur another Christmas. And those were both big deals. Those were both, like, 
there was like almost tearful joy. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy when they got me swoop that like my brothers and sisters thought I was I was like laying it on thick like okay you don't need to act like that when you get a, a Christmas present I'm like no I I really I mean it I'm so happy <laughs> what about you well I can't remember like the order of how this happened but I can remember like the first in each sort of like size class like I remember gears being my first mini bot. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> I don't know if that was the first Transformer I ever got. Yeah. Because I know for Christmas 84, there's definite photographic record of this. I got Mirage and Sideswipe. Whoa. And they would be my only Autobot cars for a long time, or, or what seemed like a long time as a child, let me say. I definitely got Skywarp very early on i don't know if i got skywarp before gears or after gears or after or before sideswipe and mirage but those were my first guys i want to say it probably went gears skywarp sideswipe and mirage but i'm not positive but that was probably all just within a period of months wow and then uh i I feel like i got soundwave for my birthday the next year oh my gosh (laughs) <laughs> like if, if if I knew you when I was a little kid, I would like even if I didn't like you, I would have wanted to come over to your house. I've been like, hey, buddy. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh, to get something for your birthday—that's amazing. Yeah, and then I think might have been the same birthday I got Optimus Prime. I'm not sure, but mm. I had like those were my main guys from the first wave. Mm. Other than I also eventually got the other five mini bots probably in that first year. So I probably had all six mini bots and then Sideswipe and Mirage, Skywarp, and I remember eventually I'm not sure when I got Starscream. Optimus Prime and Soundwave, probably all within that first year. But like all the rest, like there are so many Autobot cars I've never even owned. Never really like pursued them. It's not like I couldn't find them. I was buying so many G.I. Joes, I sort of like had to pick, Mm -hmm. you know, what I wanted at this point because I was branching out into different lines. So it's like once Transformers came around, you know, before 1984, it was like if it was a G.I. Joe thing, I wanted it for sure, Mm -hmm. and oftentimes got it, because I was a uh, only child, so (laughs) parents didn't want to hear me complain. (laughs) When Transformers came out, I had to, like, sort of pick, uh, like, it's clearly in 1984 that there were some G.I. Joe things that I did not get. I know that's because Transformers were available, and... You know, I was starting to branch out. Yeah, I know I was aware by the time I was 12 that like, oh, you have a lot of siblings and it's probably tough on mom and dad to get you like a lot of things. So Mm -hmm. I remember being like really judicious on my Christmas list and like saying, okay, here's like the two Transformers that I really like. And if you only can get one, it's this one. And that, but then I would like sample from all the various lines (laughs) because I was... At that age, I was like, if there's any science fiction elements to it at all, like science fiction slash mm-hmm. fantasy elements to it all, I'm into it. So like Dungeons and Dragons, the cartoon series, I liked it. It yeah. didn't, but it was too fantasy, right? It's like, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't really care if I get any of this stuff from that because like that's just full fantasy, right? Yeah. And if it was like too science fiction, like Star Trek was fine, but I didn't like it as a kid. You mm-hmm. know, I wasn't like, oh, Star Trek's awesome. It was too science, right down the middle, like the Star Wars sort of like hot spot of like a little bit of both. And if it had any of that, I was into it. So like, I remember one Christmas, the Christmas I got Swoop, I also got like Armed Force from Jason the Wheeled Warriors, <laughs> you know? I got um, something from Mask. I forget which Mask vehicle I got. So like I would pick one like sort of like one thing from each to get. Mm. So like I had like three He-Man figures, you know, and I had like <laughs> like two mask vehicles, one oh two RoboForce. I had a uh, hundred from RoboForce. That was that was awesome. And and I was also just like aware that like okay, there's a lot of kids to buy for here, so I'm not gonna go hog wild on this. Yeah, uh, I totally forgot to mention I was all on board for He-Man in 1982 as well. Yeah, and. Again, I can point to 1984 as the first time I was, like, passing on a He-Man figure. Mm. Before before 1984, it was, like, all Joes, all He-Man, all the time. (laughs) 
But then Transformers came around, so it's like I had to like be more judicious. Speaking from the kids' perspective, like no, like I had kids in my class who were like you, who were like that focused and determined, mm-hmm. like to get it all. And this one kid, his name was Teddy. He made a mobile for his art project of just his He Man collection, and he <laughs> and he had like everything. And I could not take my eyes off of that mobile in class. Like the teacher would be like, you know, Jersey up here, up here. I'm like, but. You don't understand. There's like Moss Man and Trap Jaw and Beast Man <laughs> and Battle Armor Skeletor, and there's right above my head. Don't put it there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like like that that looked to me like like heroic genius to have that kind of focus and determination to get it all. You know, because I always, I always only had a couple of each. <sighs> kind of to bounce back on a topic that we were talking about earlier, just like all the realizations that slowly trickle out over time that we just had no concept of back then. Yeah. Like we've recently learned that initially the Sunstreaker, what we know as Sunstreaker now was going to be Sideswipe and colored Mm -hmm. red. Mm -hmm. And what we know as Sideswipe now was going to be called Sunstreaker and colored yellow, Mm. which totally explains why in More Than Meets the Eye Part 1, Prime goes to Sideswipe for his quote-unquote rocket, rocket pack. Rocket pack, yeah. Because the Sunstreaker mold, you know, has those uh, air intakes or whatever they are at the back of the Lamborghini, mm-hmm. and they uh, they go on his back when he transforms. Mm-hmm. So I always found that strange that, like, you know, Sideswipe doesn't have a rocket pack. Well, it clearly does. He took it off, but, yeah. you know, it... it there's just little details like that. Like that was revealed in a Chris McFeely YouTube video, I believe. Chris McFeely has a great YouTube channel. Uh, definitely look that up if you're not familiar with it. But just little details like that. And also I, I heard somewhere else, it might have been on a Rodimus Primal video, that initially Starscream was going to be the blue jet and Thundercracker was going to be the gray one. Mm. And so that may even explain why we see Thundercracker a lot in the original yeah. season one intro. Like he's first and foremost the character running at us. And then Starscream and Skywarp are behind him. So maybe at the time that was animated, the blue one was going to be the important one. So just mm-hmm. just these little details that come out over time and like how we had Hauler in the first episode. And then we find out later that the Autobot cars case that was shipped to toy stores, it had two mirages in it and just one of everyone else. Yeah. So it's like they had to add a second toy of one of the guys because someone was left out. So it sounds like grapple was going to be called hauler and was going to originally be in the 84 line. So just little things like that that have come out over the years that we've had to sort of like deduce and put together. It's just sort of interesting. What this points to too is that I'm so grateful that this information comes out, not just because I'm a fan and I like to think about the, the, the intellectual property all the time, but as somebody who teaches comics, one of the things that I find is an especially challenging aspect of the job is introducing young people to the notion that there's procedure to make things and there's various steps and nothing shows up fully formed or at least very few things show up fully formed. Everything mm-hmm. is sort of cobbled together and introducing them to the idea that sometimes... Ideas just happen because that's the best you got at the time, and you got to ship the thing. Yep. And, yeah. And I think of that the Toys That Made Us episode on the He-Man series where they talk about how Battle Cat was created, and it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. it, was, it was a big gym toy. We had to have another vehicle. Like, but this tiger's <laughs> the wrong size. It's like it's like the size of like a large dog to He-Man. Like, well, just put a saddle on it, and then he can ride it. And like <laughs> this, this desperate last-minute decision, almost thoughtlessly made, generates a classic character well at least classic to our generation we'll see how well the kevin smith show does right but i love that like i'm so grateful for that those kinds of things coming out to introduce people to the idea that none of this stuff shows up as a work of prophetic genius fully formed out of the mind of an artist it is a bunch of people desperate to try to make something that works yeah back then we just had no clue there was there was a giant wall when we tried to look behind the screen sort of yeah you know it was all unsure yeah so what about comics because this was also happening at the time Uh, yeah yeah i mean transformers in 1984 was basically an onslaught attacking on all fronts (laughs) there was the cartoon there were commercials 
It was in all the toy stores, yeah. and comic books weren't going to be left out of this. So Marvel got the license to do Transformers comics. And I want to say I got like, you know, those three packs or four packs that they often had of comic books. Mm-hmm. I feel like maybe I got issues two, three, and four in one package Okay, like that. I would often go to... Uh, what were called dime stores back then, like Woolworths or Wins, mm. mm. And they would often sell comic books in three packs of slightly older issues than you would find like at the newsstand. Yeah. And I yeah. want to say I got two, three, and four in one package, and that was my f- first foray into Transformers comics. And I collected them for a long time, but I never really... I always liked certain aspects of them, but I never fell in love with the Marvel comic as I did with the with the TV show. I was always more into the TV show than I was the comic. Same here. I think I eventually quit the comic sometime in the 30s or 40s. Oh, wow. You made it that far. Yeah. I was just sort of collecting out of habit then, and eventually I was just like, eh, you know what? I'm kind of done with this. I remember feeling like this is taking a long time. Like this story, mm. I think it was issue six was the first comic that I actually bought with my own like allowance money. The, while I didn't get to go to stores very often, there was a few times where I got to go with friends to an arcade. So there was an arcade in a neighboring town. There's a bigger town outside of where I lived. And they had an arcade, and it was right next to a 7-Eleven. And this mm-hmm. is back when you can get comics at 7-Eleven. Yeah. And spinner racks. I remember like I, I'd be given a small amount of money as like an eye allowance, and I would go, I'd get a Slurpee, I'd buy two or three comics, and then we'd play video games all afternoon and then read comics. Carl. <laughs> Carl was my friend. That's right. That's who I went with. I remember seeing on the rack the cover of issue six where Shockwave is uh, like essentially killing Megatron on, yeah. the, on the cover and be like, oh, what? Shockwave <laughs> doesn't do that. You know? <laughs> so I missed the first miniseries at first. I came back to it later on when I started like more seriously collecting. But like I quickly, the great thing about the way comics were written back then was like it brings you up to speed pretty quick. Like you don't have to read the first four issues to know essentially what's going on. Yeah. And, like okay, wait a minute. Shaku is like a like a logical dude who like you know thinks he's a better leader. Like this is not congruous with what I'm used to in the Transformers right. stories. But I'll stick around and like wait a second. All the Autobots are dead, and it's like just we're Ratchet, and it's not Spike. It's a guy named Buster walking yeah. around the woods, and like what's what's going on? And like it just I get I got to like issue nine with Circuit Breaker, and and I was just like, how long is this going to go on? That the <laughs> That the, the Autobots are like the Optimus is like a head and he's like in yeah. he, he literally he's a decapitated head in a room and Shock was trying to use him to like make more Transformers. But I do have a memory of issues seven and eight as being like, I can stick around because the what's his name? Uh, William Johnson, who was the penciler on that. He really seemed to get how to make the characters look vibrant and alive. Mm. And like even in my you know little 11 year old brain. I at least had that. I could sense that when I saw it in art. I'm like, okay, that artist gets it. I don't know why this artist doesn't get it. I can't name what it is, but like the way he draws Ratchet, like it feels like Ratchet is moving. Yeah. And same thing, like there's a, a panel in issue eight where Megatron is like sitting in a chair with his leg crossed and he's like impatiently leaning his head on his hand. I'm like, <laughs> that looks like how it wasn't just on model. It was like, it felt like it was alive the way he drew it. Mm. And then he never came back. Yeah. <laughs> And then you get to issue nine and it's like, well, it's like this other artist who doesn't like seem to get the vibe of the robots the same way that other guy did. And, and so like, and it just felt like the story was taking forever to do because it was monthly. And I don't know, I just, I, it didn't match what I saw in the cartoon and it felt like it was taking too long. So I think I, I bailed out like around, I think I made it up to whatever issue the battle chargers showed up in. Mm, I think that was 22, maybe 23, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, I got about that far and then I was like, I just can't. And then, yeah. um, and it wasn't until high school when Simon Furman and Andrew Wildman were doing their stuff on the series that like, I was just browsing the comic store. Cause at this point I have my own money because like I have a part-time <laughs> job and I'm in high school and I just saw one of the covers. I forget which one it was, which one was it? It was pretty late in the series. It might've even been the one with, it was a Galvatron versus Megatron. Do you remember that cover? Mm, yeah. And then I was like, what's this? They're still doing this comic and it looks great, you know? (laughs) And then I went back and like figured out like the rest of the continuity all the way back to like the Underbase saga and all that stuff. But 
But yeah. I just want to throw out there, if you grew up loving the comics and more so than the cartoon, be sure to check out the podcast called Transformers Chronicles, mm. where Pat Sampson, he does numerous different comic book podcasts. He's reading the Marvel series for the first time, issue by issue. And so, you know, he's going back and revisiting this comic book that he never experienced as a kid. And he had experience with Transformers in general, but he never really super got into it. So... It's an interesting experience to listen to someone who who didn't walk down these roads like we did as kids mm. and like experiencing this stuff for a first time and like seeing how it appeals to someone, you know, in the year 2020. Mm. So if you, if you were more into the comics than you were the cartoon, you might want to check out that podcast. Transformers Chronicles. Pat Sampson. And this might be a good segue to start getting into some like listener comments because we actually asked people like, hey, we're going to do a season wrap up. What, what are some things you think about when it comes to Gen 1 Transformers? And we got a comment from listener Michael Thomas, an old co-worker of mine. It says, uh, I was always bemused as to why Marvel decided to make Gears the primary focus of issue three for the Spider-Man crossover. <laughs> and, and that's right. I forgot that like Spider-Man actually crossed over into the Transformers world. Yeah, because the sort of status quo at Marvel at the time is that all their books that weren't owned by them, that they were just licensing, they would throw those characters and everything into the Marvel Universe. Yeah. This was as seen by Micronauts, yeah. ROM, yeah. you know, all these comics that came out, they would have these characters that they didn't own trepsing about the Marvel Universe, and yeah. that would come and sort of bite them uh soon after which might be why they withdrew the transformers characters pretty soon like around issue 10 or so this was n no longer in the marvel universe mm. like but at the beginning spider-man was there they go to the savage land it's clearly in the marvel universe but after a while they're like uh we got to pull this out i think mm. so again you know as a kid we didn't know why it just sort of happened. There was like an announcement in the letters page or something. It's like, okay, this this is no longer happening in the Marvel Universe, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember... I, I don't remember like having a, like a lot of strong feelings about that. I don't remember being like, oh, if, if only Thor could fight Megatron, you know, right? But I mean, you were you were also a DC kid, so I was, yeah, yeah. I, I that's another thing to like make a note of is like I think the only Marvel comics I collected on purpose as a child were Transformers and uh -huh. uh, Star Com, yeah, Star Comics were Marvel. Um, I didn't read GI Joe at all. I read one issue of GI Joe, and it was the one with Ripcord and Bubbles the Balloon Bear, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> This is Excuse like. Excuse me, it's Bongo the Balloon oh, Bear. Bongo the Balloon Bear, and I was just like, I've since come around. I'm like, Larry Hama is amazing, you know. And those those comics are exceedingly well written. But as a child, I was just like, this doesn't have the rip roaring adventure that I'm expecting, you know. Right. Like this is all about like big feelings between like one GI Joe and like this woman, <laughs> and I'm used to seeing like ten GI Joes per episode, you know. Right. I'm like, like where's my value? <laughs> <laughs> And it was the same thing with the Transformers comic, where it was like, I'm just going to follow Ratchet around? Really? <laughs> like, isn't Bra Braun going to show up and do something really amazing and, like, be blasé about it? So, what else? What else do we want to reflect on? Well, in 1984, I mean, as we said before, Transformers just hit, like, a megaton explosion. So, there were all these tie-in items. There were storybooks. Mm -hmm. There were school book covers, spiral notebooks, folders. Yeah, uh, even party favors showing this bizarrely chibi style Optimus Prime with a huge head that was like the size of the rest of his body, practically. <laughs> I, that was probably my 1985 uh, birthday theme, if wow. if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah, it's like they, they had everything. So it's like if you wanted a Transformer book and record set, you could get it. If you wanted coloring books, you could get them. Yeah. They were just like hitting on all fronts. There wasn't any Transformers toilet paper, but there may <laughs> as well have been. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that goes back to like our very earliest conversations about Transformers when we first met was like we talked about like how the, there was so much that we wouldn't be surprised to find out there was Transformers toilet paper. <laughs> 
But yeah, and then the, the book and record set, I still have mine where <laughs> it was a different voice cast. Oh, sure. And I think, I want to say it was the fellow who played Mumra in Thundercats who was playing Megatron <laughs> on the record. Like, I picked up on it. And this is one of those things where, like, I'd listen to the record, like, that's not the right voice. Right. <laughs> and and I would, like, remark out loud. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that this is Mumra. <laughs> and my other siblings would be like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Can the idol chatter? Megatron snarled. I've got the attitude sensors. The big fans revolved to a stop. Well, where's the contact? Where's that pathetic carbon-based slime who helped us steal the transporter and who has now agreed to aid us in siphoning off tons of this Prudhoe Bay crude? You were the first actually or Well, yeah, it, it, it wasn't like to try to... I, I don't recall having any kind of like uh, intent to humiliate or conquer or be an alpha nerd about it. It was more like a general curiosity. Like the right. spirit that I'm, I'm, I'm showing on the show is my memory of how it was when I was like 10 or 11, which... I'm sure like to any other, you know, 12 to 13 year old would probably be pretty obnoxious to be around. So, yeah, I I remember getting a lot of eye rolls when I was when I was uh, (laughs) making those observations out loud. It's like they didn't they didn't ask me either. They're like, oh, whose voice do you think it is? Like it was it was unsolicited commentary. (laughs) They did not subscribe to my RSS feed, you know. (laughs) You being such an artist, were you that into coloring books as a kid? Not by that time. By that time, I was pretty much done with them. Mm. And and I think I think part of it had to do with the fact that I was detecting that the art wasn't like super right. awesome. Yeah, I could tell that it was there was something off about it, and I I wouldn't I probably wouldn't be able to like put language to it like what I didn't like about it. But I'd be like, eh, it's just not good. Yeah. But what's weird is like as an adult, I love that artwork now. I love <laughs> I love any Transformers merchandise where it's clear that the artist like looked at the model sheet once and then just kind of went to work. (laughs) Yeah. Especially the Transformers coloring books. They had some weird interpretations of Bumblebee for sure. Yeah. It's like, I remember seeing Bumblebee earlier in the day. Now I'm going to draw him from memory. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, I don't have a good memory. (laughs) Yeah. Like I have some of those coloring books now where it's like they clearly looked at like the airbrushed packaging art and then just like tried to turn it into lines without (laughs) actually like figuring out what the mapping was of all the shapes, you know? Yeah. Those find your fate books are the same way. It's like clearly they only had the box art to deduce what these three dimensional characters looked like i think one of the reasons i love it now is that i have been in scenarios where i have to infer from the reference material what this thing actually is yeah and and like that's not a fun position to be in <laughs> and so like you kind of have to disengage from it a little bit like oh i guess this is what it is i think they'll correct me <laughs> if i'm wrong you know so like when i see that now i get to live both sides of the experience right of being the, the, the disappointed <laughs> child going like that's not brawl uh, and then uh, being the artist who's like yeah, well, they didn't give me much to work with, kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was very into coloring books from a young age and stuck with them for much longer than my peers did. I remember I even had a Sesame Street coloring book in 12th grade. And at the time, it was only partially ironic for me to have it. Yeah. So it's like I was coloring this picture of Ernie in 12th grade. Yeah. And I remember my psychology teacher walked by and he just gave me this look like, huh, you're coloring a Sesame Street coloring book in 12th grade. Okay. <laughs> and it, it's just like it was just all summed up with his look at me. And that was probably the last time I colored in public. But uh, but yeah, if, if, if there were Transformers or G.I. Show coloring books, I was all about them at the time. I think like by the time I was 12, this is at the point when I knew I wanted to make comic books for a living and I was starting to self-define as an artist, right? (laughs) Like by the time you're 12, like that's like when the kids start sorting themselves out to like, I'm this or I'm that. I'm a sports kid. I'm a brainy kid and whatever. Yeah. And like I was standing out in my class as being like the one who had a lot of creativity and ability to draw. You know, I'm not going to say like you can actually do a search for Silver and the Periodic Forces, a comic that I made in fifth grade that I actually posted on my website. (laughs) And you can see I wasn't that great. Although it's funny when I show that to fifth graders, like, oh, you were so good. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess like there was something to what I was doing back then. But anyway, and the the comic that I posted online concludes with a transformer the size of a planet landing on the earth. (laughs) So it was prescient. It was 
So I started to, like, I was much more interested in making my own Transformers stuff. And it was partially as a result of the fact that there's so many siblings, there was only so much I could, like, purchase. But I was much more interested in drawing my own drawings of the Transformers. And I actually mm. did this, this thing in, in, I want to say, seventh grade, where I started making my own cardboard Transformers. And they were like, the challenge I was setting to myself was like, take a piece of cardboard, like the, the kind of thickness of like, say, a cereal box, and try to design a Transformer who could you could stand up in robot mode, not three dimensional, it's like two dimensional, but you should be able to fold him in such a way that he could turn into a vehicle too. That's so funny because kids in my class did a similar thing, but with paper, hmm. there was like one or two kids who made almost like origami cassettes for Soundwave. Like wow. Two, they could fit in his chest perfectly like the other cassette. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> they would be, you know, a folded sheet of paper and tape mode. But if you unfolded it a certain way, it kind of looked like something else. Yeah. But <laughs> just just like the creativity was just amazing because it never occurred to me to do anything like that. And I was just like, wow, that's really cool. It wouldn't surprise me to hear from more people that they did that as children. Because like, yeah, that just seems like a natural thing that, that they would extrapolate onto it in a way to help like creatively engage with the intellectual property, right? Like to like yeah. play with the world of trans. Because I had, my, my guy was quick shift and he turned into <laughs> a, a Renault Alliance. <laughs> 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 it's like yeah, I'm so fuel efficient and such a practical vehicle. <laughs> I offer no offensive capabilities, but I get my range is like 400 miles, guys. <laughs> I remember in this one math class we had these little blocks to play with that they weren't Legos, but they were like all cubes, and mm -hmm. like some of the sides of the cubes had like a hole for a peg to go into, and some of the sides of the cubes had a peg to go into a hole, so you could like build things out of them mm. and i remember one day we got free day so i was able to play with these cubes and i remember building little transformers out of them who didn't transform or anything but like i got all the right colors i'm like yeah. this one is prowl because he's white yeah and, you know just little things like that like transformers just seeped into every sort of nook and cranny in my life yeah i thought about them almost all the time between like i want to say like f fourth grade through well yeah, actually, all the way to high school. <laughs> <laughs> all the way till today. Yeah, I mean, like, I had, like, things that became, like, more important fandoms to me as a child. Like, in 10th grade, it was Spider-Man all the way. Like, I was nuts about Spider-Man, like, to the point where I got into heated verbal arguments with my closest friends over who loved Spider-Man the most. <laughs> but still, at the same time, in that same year, I'm working on, a you know, a Palladium Heroes Unlimited-esque role-playing module <laughs> to be able to role-play Transformers. So, like, it was always there, and it was mm -hmm. always something I thought about a lot. So... Yeah, it just sort of receded to the background a little. And, you know, other other non-nerdier kids would leave it behind completely. For us, we never left it behind. It just sort of, like, got a little further back in line to some of our other current interests. Yeah. But I remember even as recently as two thousand, the year 2000, the year 2000, how come we can't just say 2000? Why do I have to say the year 2000, right? As if I'm on Conan O'Brien. I remember at this point, I was, um, I didn't have the technology to rip audio from video yet. But what I did have is I, I, I rigged up something where I could take a tape deck and I could record directly from the VCR, the audio when I played the tapes. <laughs> so I took all my, all the Transformers episodes I had on tape and just like ran them onto audio set and i remember i was at work i was working a graphic design job at harman homes it was a uh, uh what are those, those house <laughs> buying magazines you know that you see in yeah. grocery stores so my job all day was just to, like set up grids of houses and like make it red or make it blue you know it wasn't like <laughs> that creatively stimulating but i had a walkman because that's how out of date i was even then and i'm listening on my headphones and my, one of my coworkers like well what did you listen to thinking that i'm gonna like give him some like great music recommendations you know <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm listening to tra Transformers episodes. Like, what? <laughs> and like, he took my headphones from me and like started listening for a second. And then he went around the whole office going like, guys, <laughs> he went to the trouble of making audio cassettes of Transformers episodes so he could listen to them at work. What is this? What is, what is this guy doing? You know, I remember being in college and also listening to my Walkman and I had the Transformers, the movie soundtrack playing. And I remember feeling so awesome because it's like this was the music that was playing during the attack on Autobot City. And there's just yeah. that. I just remember like stomping around the college campus 
feeling awesome, but had anyone known what I was listening to, they would have pointed out all my non-awesomeness. He must be listening to Pantera the way he's walking. Right. Yeah. But yeah. But instead you're listening to, no, it's Vince Ticola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and similarly, yeah, when I got the soundtrack on audio cassette, that was a very, very happy day. I mean, it was because yeah. I didn't, again, where I grew up, I didn't have access to a whole lot of information. So, like, I, it wasn't until high school that I found out it even existed. And it, it was a kid in my class, like, oh, yeah, I've got the soundtrack. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, the first BotCon I ever went to in 1997, it was only because they were like, we're releasing the full soundtrack to the Transformers movie. I'm like, well, I have to go now. You know, it's like, well, you can meet this person, that person. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm going for the exclusive. I got to get that CD. And and then it just so happened that Vince DiCola and Stan Bush were there and I got to get it autographed at the show. That was pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. (laughs) Yeah. And you and I were already talking at that time. So it was like, we were all full back into this. Yeah. Yeah. We really were. That was a good weekend. That was a very good. Week. <laughs> I was I was so happy because I, I they actually performed the soundtrack at the convention and with like a laser yep. light show and it was like transcendent. It's probably still on YouTube now. Oh, it probably is. That's from 1997. If you want to look yeah. that up, 1997, Vince DiCola and Stan Bush. Con 97. Uh, yeah. Hey gang. We had so much material this episode, which is funny because we at first worried we weren't going to have enough material, but we had so much that we're going to make this two episodes. So this is part one of the season one wrap up. And next week you'll get part two of the season one wrap up. Thanks for listening, guys. Later. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas-mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4millionyearslater at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>